Okay, so we're on 6a now, which is absolute space-time proportionality and relativity. So I think you all understand that, <clears throat> that you can change how, how far away empire beams will contribute to needed positions in two ways. At a given pitch, you fix your pitch, you can change the contribution by manipulating the diameter of your cylinder, the radius of your cylinder changing on that power series of phi changes how much contact that it can make in turn at that pitch. And then the other thing is if you fixed your cylinder radius, then uh, you can shrink your distance between wafers on that power series of the pitch in order to increase the amount of empire beams that will make contact with other needed clock positions. So of course what that means in general is that at a given cylindrical radius we have to make a trade-off so that if we have, let us say, 100 center emperor positions, and if we wanted to cover a very large distance in our metric space of the QSN, um, then we will put our spacing, that is our pitch magnitude, will be high and that will cause the distance, that will cause the contribution from some center emperor here to drop off, right? Because these beams are going out like ray tracings. And so if I were to have a pitch that is so great that my next wafer is here, Okay, it's possible that I, that I could find a pitch where there is simply no contribution at all. So if there were no contribution at all, then in your S index that defines all of the accelerations, all of the patterns, you can have an S index that defines a random walk over 100 steps if you like. And you could say, all right, one of those patterns is, is a pitch of x where x is right at the limit, where, where just x minus 1, if it was x minus 1, then that would give you some trivial amount of savings because that center emperor would make, let's say, just one contact this way and this way. And then just And then at x, then that could go to, to no savings, right? So you could just have no savings whatsoever. So of course, this is implying a statistical speed limit for this game. And, we, and it may e either be statistical or may be absolute. It just depends on how we want to... Um, instruct our random number generator. In other words, if there is a column of boxes with different s values, <coughs> right? So we have all of these savings values representing different random walk patterns that can be taken. So there's still a non-zero probability, one, if we had one savings. But what if, there was, what if there was a case where there's zero savings? In that case, there's a zero weight, and the random number generator would never pick that one. So it just depends, right? We gotta, 
do the simulations, analyze it, see if there really is actually a case where there's zero, because I don't know if there is. If, there is. if there's a case where it's never zero, but it can go down to a very small number like one, and other numbers are uh, much bigger on average, and these S indices, of course, are outrageously long. These columns for random walks would be huge numbers. Finite, though, because of our discrete space, but still very big. But it could turn out that we find out that our game physics is implying that it is statistically very improbable that you would observe a fermion uh, propagating at greater than C. I mean, if the probability is 10 to the negative 500, that's good enough for me to approximate classic, you know, or classic general relativity and special, special relativity. But we'll see. So something to be explored. But in either case, there's either a statistical speed limit that is a very low, low probability for this limit here, right? Or... Um, or it's an absolute thing. Um, I want to make a comment about the interesting universality of this, this label that I have, S1 cross S2. I suggest you talk to Ray if you want to understand formally why it's a tensor product and not me, I'll mess it up, although I comprehended what Ray told me yesterday. But um, the universality of this, right? I believe all black holes rotate, and I believe all stars, all suns rotate. Our sun rotates. I believe all planets rotate. I believe all asteroids rotate. And I believe all empire waves, as fundamental particles, rotate. Um, I believe all galaxies rotate. I believe all clusters of galaxies rotate. And I believe every one of those things that I just said translates, right? I don't believe that there's any such thing as an electron at rest. And I don't think there's any, anything that's not translating. So if everything is rotating and translating, then you kind of have this universality of this S1 cross S2 idea. Not exactly, because things are rotating on axes, and our spin structure, our clock, is, is kind of like a cheerleader rotating a baton. It's kind of like a spherical rotation. But we do know that everything is oscillating because of quantum oscillations. So we know that an electron in real reality does not translate in a straight line, even in a flat gravitational field. We know that, that the Zitterbogen, how do you pronounce that, Richard? Zitterbogen. Zitterbogen, right, is the helical kind of path of an electron because it's oscillating and translating at the same time, so it takes on a kind of helical path and we know that this concept exists in photons. So anyway, it's just interesting, it's not a big deal, but the idea that maybe there's this universality in the mathematics of physics where, where really everything from astrophysical to the, to the fundamental particle scale has this same concept of, of helical motion. And, and maybe that's a, a, a kind of guiding principle to kind of get get a, a new way of, fresh ways of thinking, fresh tools. So, geodesics. So, next one is about geodesics. So, the structure of this pattern, the ruled surface around this empire wave, let's kind of just try to get artistically creative here. We're going to draw these big arcing things like I drew before on the other version of this whiteboard. I mean, this is not good enough because I don't know how to draw this 
the closest pattern that I can see that matches with my vision, visual imaginations, is what I said before. It's the projection of, a, of about 100 hot fibers on a three sphere projected on a certain type of axis that gives it that nice tube down the center and those seven nested um, toruses. Um, but, so I don't know how to draw this, but I'm trying to draw something that is my S1 and my S2 component, this idea of the integration, you know? So, you know, I don't know how to draw that. Maybe I'll just draw other helices around it going out something. That's a bad version, but it's this complicated thing, right? And the whole point is that it's very twisty. It's not twisty in a way that is like normal, normal Euclidean geometry. It's twisty in a weird way because it has this, in, this microscopic three-sphere rotation going on that kind of reminds me of Kaluza and Klein's theory unifying uh, gravitational theory with electromagnetism where they imagined this hidden Planck scale rolled up thing, like this curled up thing at the Planck scale, you know, kind of at the core of these particles that requires a fifth mathematic, ma mathematical dimension. And so because of the mathematical complexity of this tensor product, even with my you know, relatively unsophisticated training in algebraic mathematics, I just don't, I just don't expect that real numbers are going to do the trick. Like this thing is, this integration is so complicated mathematically and it relates ultimately to shift vector and rotations because we always think about translating um, projection windows, but we're going to be thinking more about rotating projection windows in the first part of this year. So I don't think real numbers are going to do the trick. And so it would be at very least complex numbers, but I have a funny feeling about quaternions. So I think most of us who I've said this to, like the three or four people I've said this to, kind of say, yeah, it's pretty pretty probable that real numbers aren't going to do the trick. So probably it'll be complex or quaternions. All right, so um, this twisty, wavy, complicated, higher dimensional, this, you know, I'll call those higher dimensional numbers, all right? Like this, the, the quaternions, complex numbers, octonions, they're like higher dimensional numbers. They have associations with higher dimensional Lie lattices geometrically. Um, but at the end of the day, these ruled surfaces are these beautiful, complex, twisty things. And Fong uses this word called gearing. So just imagine another version of this representation here, out over here. And we've already said that the self-interaction of one kind of like a plasma wake field or like a, a Bohmian pilot wave, right? Its own self-interaction riding its own wave with this future and past influence or integration is how it behaves. But when it gets in close contact with another particle, right? Because of the one over R squared, it's going to drop off on influence very quick. So an electron that's, that's even inches away from another electron in our game electron, it's 99% of its influence is going to be its self-influence riding its own guide wave, okay? But as soon as it gets meaningfully close, then all of a sudden the guide wave or, the em or this integrated empire wave of the other one is now going to start playing a very meaningful role in the next time to random walks that we'll build out a little bit later on the board make, as we try to make um, a toy S index. All right, cool. So that's easy to say. So as, it, as this one over here, I'll just draw this to be exactly kind of like that, but it's like this. I'm going to draw it as an X. And it's approaching this now. It's getting down toward the angstrom scale of distance. 
And let's count, let's count the, what I'll call intrinsic state variables. So intrinsic means intrinsic to the empire wave. So we have our helicity value of right or left, right? We speculated on a value uh, called spin, but I can at least call it mirror A and mirror B. Or I'll call it, I'll call it, this, we'll just call this helix right left, and we'll call this 20 group right left, right? Where this relates to a circle and this relates to a sphere. So if we've got something like this, if we can put this to work, right? It's part of the QSN. And the QSN, by the way, is really fundamental if you understand the Fibonacci icosagrid construction method. Because all you're doing is just taking an icosahedron and you're putting infinite planes on every one of the 20 facets. And then you translate copies of those 20 infinite planes. You translate copies out infinitely far by Fibonacci matching rule spacings. And just by creating an infinite set of 20 parallel classes of planes, the way that the planes intersect generates the edges and the vertices of all of our regular tetrahedra in the superpositions of the right and left 20 groups at the same time. So that's so mathematically fundamental, that simple construction method, that it's really quite remarkable that a subspace of that construction is exactly the projection of E8 root vector lattice to R4 in four dimensions, and then a slice of that. It's really, inter it's really interesting. We, we did not expect that. It just is true. Okay, so the point is, I have a great appreciation for the right and left, but I don't know how to use them. Like, I, I'm talking in this last six months, and we've been constructing this empire wave, but you don't hear me talking much about the right or the left. It seems like we've got to figure out how to put that to work. But the point is, is, all right, maybe that's an intrinsic state variable. Maybe we'll figure out how to use it. Maybe we'll notice that there's a difference. Maybe we'll notice that we have a dipole, and we'll understand the nature of this dipole, you know, from first principles, our game dipole. So we have a dipole. So we have dipole side A and dipole side B. Okay, so that could potentially be three binary sign values. So that's what I'm calling intrinsic state variables. It's not a relational state variable between one empire wave and another. Another intrinsic state variable is its pitch, which is the power series of the golden ratio, which defines what its rate of propagation is over 100 frames through distance, space, versus internal cycles of clock, right? This expected proportionality between the particle's expression of pattern through clock count cycles versus just pure distance along the helical axis. And then the other one is cylindrical radius. So cylinder radius. All right, so we have, so we have a bunch. So we've got this set of possible intrinsic state variables. So let's not decide what the intrinsic state variables of this empire wave is, right? This is another empire wave. It's gotten to be at about an angstrom distance. And so because it's at angstrom distance now, it's having a huge contribution from this guy's ruled surfaces, whereas a few angstroms further in distance, it was mostly interacting with its own intrinsic variables, that is, its own empire wave. So some ways of matching the intrinsic state variables, so now, so now if these are intrinsic state variables, for this one, we have a different set of intrinsic state variables for this one. So we have, in, we have intrinsic state variables A, and we have a set of intrinsic state variables 
B, which generates relational state variables. So then you have a state of relational state variables where you can say, all right, one relational state variable is the angle of the two dipoles. That's a relational state variable. Another relational state variable would be how, how their spin values are paired, if there is a spin value, right? If we found a spin value that we liked in the game physics, then we could realize that it's probably true that if you have a spin A and a spin A, and they're at an angstrom distance, that you should have different kinds of opportunities for savings than if you had a spin A and a spin B. Same thing with the helicity. So your relational state variable states are helicity right, right, helicity left, left, helicity right, left, that's it. And so I could draw out more of the relational state variables, but I had already done that on the diagram that we had on the board for a couple months. And I think you, you know about it. If you don't, you should memorize the relational state variables and keep in mind the, to be out, you know, this, this, this means when I talk like this, this means, hey, guys, be on the lookout for this. Like, this is what I'm hiring you to do to see if any of these things can be true, right? To, to focus us and prioritize us. Uh, okay, so geodesics. So, all right, so I've got, I've got this particle here. It's getting really close now. It's an angstrom away. And this is a big, wavy, cur curvy, crazy, complex, discrete field that this guy moving in this direction is going to see as its energy landscape. And click by click by click, all of the random walks that this can take have to be defined in our S index. So as a particle moves through a geodesic path, click by click by click by click by click, right? Random walks, where a random walk, I believe, should generally be more than one inflation. The reason I think it should be more than one inflation is because I think of a random walk as a kind of minimal evolution of a clock's cycle. So I would like a random walk at a minimum to be a clock cycle. But I'm not opposed to having a random walk just be literally a single, a single inflation. But for right now, let's pretend they're just little short animations of five Planck moments, five inflations, five steps. And because the S index probabilities are going to literally mean that the random walks of this particle here are going to flow into or away from this guy depending on its intrinsic state variable, uh, relational state variables. In other words, some relational state variables will be what Fong calls bad gearing. And some relational state variables will be what Fong calls good gearing or constructive gearing. In other words, the relationship between two ruled surfaces that creates great opportunities for object savings or a, a, a pairing and a relationship between all these relational state, these intrinsic state variables that creates the opposite. And what is the opposite? In other words, this is an important concept. When this guy was alone, way out here, 100 angstroms away, okay, it's having frame savings. Why is it having frame savings? It's having frame savings because of its interaction with its own empire wave. And if it's in a state of momentum, it's just enjoying this nice constant average of frame savings. And if it comes in contact with another particle that's geared improperly, that is the relational state variables are going to conflict, right, with its, with its self-interaction, right? I'll call it electron self-interaction, but game electron self-interaction. 
So in some cases, it's better for that particle. It will have better opportunity to have frame savings by keeping away from that guy because it's it's not matched. The relational state variables would not be matched. And it would be better to get alone, get back into its own little envelope where it can keep feeding off of its own self-interaction of frame savings. But in other cases, it's possible that it can be plus, right, plus n. In other words, it has its own frame savings of some value averaging. And then by integrating in, it can have synergy the good gearing that Fong calls it. And in that case, you have, I'll call it plus S, right? You had some S, some S here, and then you get to some S prime, which is a, which, where S prime is, is greater uh, than, than S, right? So either getting close is gonna give you f savings that's greater than the former s of, a, of the self-interaction or less than. If it's less than, the random walks will imply that it moves away. If it's greater than, the random walks will imply that they will align in certain ways. You'll have dipole alignments. You'll have random walks in the s index that are equal to dipole rotations because that gives a better gearing, better s values. So the point is, that's all very hand wavy, and it's stuff that can only be argued about, not verbally. It just has to be d taken down to the simulation scale. So we have to figure out how it is that we're going to get so computationally sophisticated that we can actually do these types of simulations. How do we do that? And, that, and later after lunch, I'm going to be trying to to really build up your um, deeper understanding of why we need an algebra to describe. We need to get away from geometry. We need to get away from trigonometry, projective geometry, the ad hoc arbitrary placement of irrationally sloped windows on root vector lattices of Lie algebras. And we need to get to a pure algebra that describes the projection transformers so that we can then go to the matrix mathematics isomorphism of that algebraic formalism. Why? Two reasons. Matrix representations are elegantly reductive and compact and they are also the way computers talk, right? And that's what I believe is our, is our path until we can understand that mathematics and get it into matrix representation without having to, f to fuss with geometry until we want to render you know, some, some simulations uh, where, where we only need 24 frames per second. We don't need Planck scale right? renderings. But, so, but the point is, long story short of this section, is that the way that this will repel and the way that this will attract will always be along geodesic-like paths. It'll never repel just in a straight line away. It'll never attract into the field of another in a straight line because it's like Pac-Man. It's changing, it's, it's doing its random walk patterns to eat the free lunch of object savings or S values and those are defined as the ruled surface like the dance of Venus and Earth. So you will see everything move in geodesics as we observe. And so Einstein um, had an assumption, of course, that he had two assumptions. One is that space-time has no substructure. And if it has no substructure, then how can it be logical that a particle can have an absolute sense of motion relative to pure nothingness? So he was totally logical and correct in his logic, right? But of course, every logical deduction has an unprovable axiom or assumption that you must conjecture. And so for us, we have substructure. We have a, a point space, the possibility space. It gives us a metric. It gives us a directly integer metric in a power series where there is a, a cutoff on the power series, which is defined by the window B that we 
select, to operate on, to create our possibility space. And that means these particles really do have an absolute rate over n frames of propagation relative to the metric space. It also means that we have an absolute internal clock time um, that, we, that can literally be counted if we are the simulators. So being the simulators is like being God, like outside of the system entirely, right? And then we can see, but if you were in the system as an avatar in this simulation, how would you possibly know any of these things? You would only be operating according to what you experience. And so the only way that any pattern or entity, such as an electron, can come up with an opinion about the clock cycles of another propagator or the propagation of another propagator is relative to that clock's ratio of, of d over t, propagation through distance versus propagation through its internal time. Right? So our, our game is implying that the only measurements possible for entities in the system are relativistic. And so for them, that's the only knowledge they have access to. That's their reality knowledge-wise. For us, as the programmers of the simulation, uh, we, we, we see you know, the math. It's just counting. So we have both absolute propagation through space and time and the prediction that the, that the patterns in, if they could measure, can only measure relativistically. And we have this idea that they move on geodesic paths. So the other, um, the other thing that Einstein assumed is he assumed that if they move in geodesic paths, it means ontologically that space-time is curved into the fourth dimension. So this is a, a delicate subject because I believe Einstein was correct in, in, in a deep, deep way about space-time curvature. And I believe he was incorrect in another deep way about space-time curvature. So to explain, science has used geodesic mathematics, very similar to, how, to what Einstein used, to model the arcing geodesic pathways of particles moving in relation to other particles in electromagnetism. But because they already had the device of flux tubes and other models to think about, they did not ontologically decide that just because the geodesic mathematics describes the walks of electromagnetic particles relative to one another, that that means that ontologically that three space is curved into the fourth dimension. Einstein, on the other hand, said, no, I choose to presume that space-time is literally ontologically curved into the fourth dimension because they move in geodesics. So you see, it's a matter of taste because the guys in electromagnetism could have said the same thing if they wanted to, and it, and it, would, be, it would be kind of okay because mathematically that's, uh, there's an isomorphism. So two things that are isomorphic are not the same thing. They just have an equivalency. Right? They're not analogs of one another. They have this pure equivalency to one another, but they are still different things. So why would Einstein's, why, why would I say Einstein's um, math has some deep, deep truth? And it's because of this. It's because of the work that Fong and Richard did. So I had an intuition about this for many years, and finally when Richard joined us, um, I was able to team Fong up with somebody who could test out uh, this conjecture that I had, which is that the twist that we discovered um, in, in the year uh, 2000 uh, was mathematically equivalent to, isomorphic to, curving space into um, the fourth dimension, curving three space into the fourth dimension. And the reason I had that intuition was because of a bunch of psychic intuition that I can't explain, but it's also because of a bunch of logical deductive guesswork. 
Um, and it was because it was because the it was because of my familiarity with the value arc cosine one quarter. So arc cosine one quarter is the dihedral angle of the simplest building block of four-dimensional space. So that is the dihedral angle of the four simplex. The four simplex is the equidistant array of five points in four-dimensional space. So it's the fully connected and non-directed graph of five objects. So that's how you'd represent the fully and fully connected and undirected graph of five objects typically in a in a graph theory textbook. And so you try to symbolize it by equally spacing things around a circle. Um, and you draw it that way because you don't want to make too much closer because that's a bad symbol. It doesn't represent this idea of... Uh, so in graph theory, you have magnitudes on connections, right? But the fully connected graph of five objects implies no magnitude differences between the connections. And graph theory deals with connections. They should call it connection theory. So this has a connection value <coughs> of 1. And this has a connection value of 1 over phi. Um, so it's placing two magnitudes. But when you want to really have the simplest reduced idea of the fully connected graph of five objects, and if you did want to draw it symbolically, you'd really need four spatial dimensions. Because 4D is the only way that you can take five points and have all of them be e equidistant from one another. You can't do it in 3D, you can't do it in 2D. So this four simplex is a really neat object. And so you say, well, that's kind of cool that when you evenly distribute them on a circle, you just get the golden ratio right out of there, as though the golden ratio has something to do with five, right? So, so where would the five come up in, in the equidistant array fully connected of five points? in four-dimensional space if I don't represent them in 2D. Because then I'm not going to have this delta between these two connection values, this and this, that's, that's phi. Well, you get it in the dihedral angle, arc cosine one quarter. So the dihedral angle, arc cosine one quarter, can be written as arc cosine one half, which is 60 degrees, right, plus arc cosine 3 times the golden ratio minus 1 divided by 4. So as you build out the simplex series, you can build out each higher simplex by rotating a 1 simplex from that n simplex by 60 degrees into the next spatial dimension such that it places the point at the other end of that 1 simplex to be equidistant from the previous, from any of the previous points. So it's as though the 60 degree is the iterative generating angle to keep folding out higher and higher order uh, n simplexes. So I look at it, I call it the trivial component of these irrational values. So the simplex series is like, is like this. Right? So it follows, it just follows the sequential integers as the denominator. So it's the arc cosine of all of those. So this one is really a special one as the equidistant array of five points because the non-trivial component, that is the irrational component, is this beautiful angle that is at the core of our entire physics program. <clears throat> For example, if you take a slice of the elser sloan quasi-crystal, and then you try to compound it with five others in 3D, the way we do, and you were to rotate it by any other angle than this, you would not generate a quasi-crystal because you would have arbitrary closeness as you go out. So this angle is the only one that gives you non-arbitrary closeness 
and a finite set of vertex types throughout the whole, a finite set of distances, everything beautiful. That under, if you did a Fourier transform, it would have discrete Bragg peaks and so on. It's a quasi-crystal. So this is, this is a really powerful number that's so deep to the core of our business here that we're doing in physics. And it gives us an, an, a bonus sign value. Because if you just project E8 to 3D, you have no chirality. But the way that we build this equivalent kind of structure that's equivalent plus a bonus is because the QSN embeds the classic space-filling quasi-crystal with H3 symmetry, with no twist or anything, it's space-filling. But another regime of the QSN is the tetrahedral regime, which, which is built on twist. Um, and that gives us a binary sign value of right and left that I think we're going to be using as one of our intrinsic state variables for our empire waves. You know, you need, you're going to need a few, if from a first principles theory like this, we're going to need a few binary values that are really, really fundamental because we have a few binary values that are really fundamental in physics. So, um, so anyway, so then I said, all right, because this is a four-dimensional angle, and then I got Julio uh, as a mathematician here in the past, I got him to do something for me, calculate something for me, and my interpretation of it was giving me interpretations from his words and my own thoughts about it that, that there was an equivalency between rotating and curving like an, a pure isomorphism, and, um, and that was never really clear because it, it didn't have anybody to really prove it or talk to me enough about it or whatever. But then when Richard came, I commissioned he and Fong to do this thing that I had been wanting to do for, a few, for several years. And at the end of the day, our paper um, that, I mean, they did all the work on it. So this paper shows an isomorphism between curving three space into the fourth dimension or allowing the objects to contract, right? So under projective transformation, you can keep it in the lower dimension and just have things adjust to describe the geometric frustration that occurs when you try to compress the information of a higher dimensional structure down into a lower dimension. That compression is, in some sense, information that needs to be e released or expressed in some way. So it can be expressed in three ways that I know of, through contraction, volumetric, edge contraction, right? At the end of the day, edge contraction. So the edge contraction is one typical way that geometric expression is expressed in projections. And then another way you can think about it is to just mathematically understand it as that lower dimensional thing implying curvature into the next higher dimension. And then the third way is uh, twist. And the thing about twist as opposed to the other two ways is the twist way gives you a binary value because you can twist it this way and you can twist it, you, you know, you have a chirality sign value. Well, remember, the curvature also gives you the oh, that's true. Right, you have the two forms of curvature. So speaking of the two forms of curvature, so we have these two forms of curvature in, in general relativity, and up until the last couple years, nobody in their wild imagination would have guessed that the average curvature of the entire universe is perfectly flat Euclidean geometry. I read a really cool article about that. Um, it was more like a, an article in a journal. Anyway, they said these astrophysicists were, are mind-boggled. There's a lot of upheaval in astrophysics in the last 10 years. Like a lot of things like way more upheaval than in material science or, 
you know, gauge symmetry physics, just rocking their world, like really closely held, closely cherished beliefs are being challenged. And there's not just a couple, there's like four, five, six things. And it just comes from more powerful observational equipment, but more importantly, more powerful computational ability to crunch numbers and more ever more sophisticated mathematical techniques as well to interpret them. Anyway, uh, so this WMAP data paid for by uh, NASA is the most um, you know, rich data set uh, ever on the total um, curvature through the understanding of the mic cosmic microwave background data. And they, have all, they basically take all of this and they do these calculations and to their uh, amazement, it averages out unexpectedly to, to just being Euclidean flat. There's nothing in any theory that's known that, would, that implies that. So it's a big opportunity to understand something very deep. Now, there is one possibility and that it could have just been a coincidence so they calculated the coincidence probability. That is the quantum fluctuations at the Big Bang, right? So the Big Bang quantum fluctuations are what define all of the distribution of, of the curvature in the universe. It's what defines the distribution of galaxies and the voids of vacuum in between. That was all described by the quantum fluctuations at the Big Bang. So in order for, they calculated in order for the curvature to just perfectly balance out to pure Euclidean flatness that the quantum fluctu the probability, the statistical probability of the quantum fluctuations at the Big Bang being just right to do that is 10 to the negative 43. A really uh, bad probability, which is good information because it's implying now to astrophysicists that it's probably not a coincidence because it's 10 to the negative 40 something that it's got to be something deep about space-time theory and quantum mechanics that we don't know right because quantum fluctuations dealing with big bang theory is really problematic because you're talking about a species that at this point have no predictive quantum gravity theory so there's something that may be emerging from this new quantum gravity theory that we could discover that could, that could explain it without it just being, oh, it's a coincidence at the, at the level of one out of 10 to the negative 43. Okay, so we're, we're building our whole physics. Are we really using Euclidean geometry? You think we are, and in a way we are, but not really, because we're taking higher dimensional Lie lattices we're compressing that information down to lower dimension, creating geometric frustration. So we've got to use one of the three isomorphisms of curvature as contraction, curvature as literal curvature into the next dimension, or curvature as twist, which we've proven is isomorphic. So then what we have is something very similar to uh, causal dynamical triangulation. So in causal dynamical triangulation, they use um, three simplexes, and then they, they take the three simplexes and they join them at faces like this. So you have one three simplex joined here with another three simplex, right? So they're kissing faces. So in causal dynamical triangulation, they have a mathematical value at the junction of the, of the two faces. So at the junction of the two two simplexes, they have a reg calculus deficit angle that has an arbitrary uh, possible value, a possible, so there's a bound. So the, val the value of the reg calculus deficit angle can, in their theory, has a limit at x and another limit at y within their theory. Within, 
within these two limits, so the deficit angle describes the curvature between the two three-dimensional simplexes. So within those two bounds, there's an infinity, a smooth infinity of possible values that the deficit angle can take. And that's, and that's, that's so I talked to Lee Smolin once about our program and he said you should really kind of look at how similar it is to the deficit angle using regular tetrahedra, 3D tetrahedra, and having them joined at faces that where the curvature for, for, for space-time theory is described in the deficit angle. So you might think that CDT is very discretized because they're discretizing chunks of Euclidean three space in the form of three simplices. And it is, but then it's not very discretized in terms of the values of the curvature because it can take on this infinity of values between the bounds in the theory. So what we're attempting to do is to use something equivalent to a deficit angle value an isomorphism. Fong even calculated the deficit angle isomorphism. And we have only one numerical value, but it comes in a plus and a minus. So we're, go we're going hyper discrete. We're also, like CDT guys, Amjorn and Lull, discretizing our chunks of three space into little Euclidean Planck scale volumes. But we're describing our curvature in the form of twist, which is isomorphic to a deficit angle value, which is isomorphic to curving the, three the two three spaces into the fourth dimension. So that might be why Einstein's equations are so true and beautiful and, and predictive and realistic, right? Because there really is a deep mathematical truth to three space curvature, but we're going to divide up space into these little chunks, and we're going to limit our magnitude to plus or minus one value, this. And then hopefully in great constellations of sequences, we can find the approximation of curved, smooth curved space time. Because what is all of this structure made out of? It's made out of this curvature. Right? Everything I'm describing, the S values, the statistics, everything, these empire waves, these clocks, the whole thing is made of two ingredients. The simplest bit of three-dimensional space, the three simplex, plus a relationship between three simplices, which is equivalent to three space curvature, a little quantum of three space curvature. So we are quantizing gravity in a, in, a, in a way that's very different than loop quantum gravity. So they quantize the spin foam, but they allow an infinity of magnitudes of values. We're going to quantize without an infinity of allowed values. So we're going hyper discrete, which makes our program do or die. In other words, by restricting ourselves that severely, it either has to work or it can't work. Because if it can't work, then we're, we're, then we're screwed. We've got to change our mission statement and go back to doing what everybody else does, which, take, which is taking observables where we don't know why they are and then plugging them into, into equations to make, to make the equations physically realistic. Uh, and another, just giving another encouragement as to why our method of discretizing space-time is a good idea, is Amjorn and Lull and Lee Smolin, Ashtakar and those guys, they don't dis discretize space-time in a manner that would easily allow them to make contact with the standard model of particle physics. Because the standard model of particle physics has its origin in Lie algebraic theory. So our way is not a bad idea. We take Lie algebraic root lattices, mathematically transform them to get our discretized space, and as a bonus, we get a language, a pure code based ultimately on the Fibonacci matching rules, 
which happen to have the exact same form as the Fibonacci anion rules, fusion rules, which can describe the quantum statistics of any topological phase of matter. So that's a great opportunity to explore, you know, is the space-time code itself a topological structure, a quantum topological structure, like a quantum topological superfluid, if you will? And if it is, is it possible that Fibonacci anions could describe that topological structure? Because Fibonacci anions can describe the quantum statistics of any topological phase of matter known. And then, then that would beg the question of, all right, well then is it just a coincidence then that the Fibonacci anion fusion rules have the same form as our rules, which are based on Fibonacci matching rules of the same form? Okay, so that was a little bit about gravity, where the theme of a lot of that was saying that Einstein was right about space-time curvature as long as we can accept that an isomorphism of that is possible in the form of twist in a discretized space-time view. So the next thing I want to say about gravitational theory is why would gravity be like 10 to the 40 times weaker than electromagnetism? And why would gravity, unlike electromagnetism, have only apparent attraction and not repulsion and attraction? Why is it so different in those two ways? So, so we talked about a toy explanation for why our game is going to have a speed limit, right? So that's a kind of special relativistic contact. Uh, suggestion of contact. And we talked about why, if you want to propagate your pattern more through space, your beams are going to drop in density faster and you're not going to make as much contact, so you're always going to get less clock cycles if you keep stretching out your pitch. So you have this special relativistic, this thing that's reminiscent of special relativity. But that still says nothing about gravity. So here's something kind of cool to think about. We talk about these helices and we kind of acknowledge the idea that any beams that are even a little bit off center line are going to eventually drop off and not help you to make contact with your positions forward in time and backwards in time. But what if there was a beam going right down the center line? Like what if we built a clock that required a beam to go right down the center line. If we did have a beam that goes down the center line, that is a Fibonacci chain, or a Fibonacci chain of 20 groups, okay? If we did, then if you place, let's just call it a, a, a set of points. If you did, remember the principle of, of our clock is that no matter how far in the future you get helpful points that are going to make contact with your needed points at some pitch, you only do it once. So if I had a center line axis that was required to be part of my clock structure, and it lays down points that are going to make contact in the clocks to infinity in both directions, um, then one center emperor placement can lay down a hell of a lot. Now, I'm not saying that that center emperor placement at whatever its power of phi is will necessarily have to make contact with, um, with every one of the wafers. But I will say that if that power of phi was at phi 1, for example, then indeed or I would say if it's at power of, if it's at a power of phi two and the minimum pitch is phi two because your possibility space is phi one, right? So you have to do inflations and the minimal inflation that you can do is phi two. So if that empire beam was laid down at phi two, it lays down a set of points forward and backwards in time to infinity if, if you want to take it that far. And that means that any other pitch at a power greater than phi 2 
is going to have its points as a subset of the points at the phi 2. Okay, so I don't know for sure how it's going to work. All I know is I'm convinced that if we did have a center line, that it would be exponentially fewer center emperor positions than what is needed for this. Because this, you have to keep adding more and more and more center emperors because they keep dropping off. You know, you have to just keep adding it. And you could find that you get ratios that are really big, maybe even ratios like this. Right? In terms of the quantity of center emperor positions to satisfy all the positions on the center line versus the quantity of center emperor positions over some distance that you would need to describe all of the other structure of your clock, the parts that drop off. So I don't know if it would be that big. You know, The thing is, is we may find that we're going to have to eventually move to cylinders that are quite large. Right? right now, we're just practicing with these manageable cylinders because we need a model that gives us a pitch set of ranges that, that, want, that can model the electron at rest. So we have at rest, or we have moving very, very, very slowly. So if the pitch is at phi 2, that represents a particle moving very, very slowly through our metric space. And that means its clock cycling or experience of time is going to be very, very high because these wafers will be just so compactified. But we have to have it go. We want, it to, we want to have some kind of toy model or idea for what C is. So C is very fast. So C would, rep C, C would represent a place where, the, where, where the, um, the spacing of the pitch is so terrible that the clock cycles are, have ground down to a halt. Right Now, it can never get to C, but it can get to almost C. So we really need this big span from phi 2 to some value of phi n, where n seems to me that it has to be larger than some really big power of phi, like probably larger than, say, just making up a number here, but let's say it has to be larger than, than phi you know, I don't know, phi to the 50. It, it's going to have to be a very high power of phi that, that this thing terminates off at. And in order to make it terminate off that far down the power series of phi, remember, because we're talking about a speed limit of C defined by the drop-off. So the problem is the ones we're using now, the drop-off is very early, which would imply a speed limit that's much, much, much less than C. So we have to learn more about how adjusting the radius of the cylinders manipulates the powers of phi that you can go to before it drops off to zero contribution. Oh, yeah, 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 you're right, Fong. I, I meant to say, I meant exactly to say n, I, where, where n would be greater than 50. Yeah. OK, so, so just part of our work that we can do this year, like things that can get converted into assignments and explorations and questions um, all in the spirit of game physics, because we've just got to put our toe in the water and see if we can make things that are slightly reminiscent of what we understand physical observations to the be. The 10 to the 42 one, if you measure the flux density, it could uh, easily achieve that. Right, like we were talking. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to mention that. But Fong has a, another idea on it that's really good, too. So something, something to look for. Now... Um, now, after lunch, I'll complete the second. I said there are two things that are, seem interesting about gravity. One is the huge delta of strength between electromagnetism and gravity, right? So we threw out an idea on that. Fong has what I, was probably even a better idea that she can talk to us all more about in the future. So the other question, if you recall, is, okay, well, why would gravity then be attractive you know, maybe there's, maybe there's repulsive gravity, but let's just pretend there's only attractive gravity and then ask in the game physics by explaining it as, as we're explaining it. Well, I haven't explained the attraction yet, actually. So after lunch, I'm going to talk about how these beams going out 
um, are going to drop like 1 over r squared, of course. Right? If they're going out from a planet, you have all these dipole possibilities. Um, does everybody understand why a quasi-crystal can have an infinity of directions of Fibonacci chains? Yeah, it's basically at each power, if you can go to any power of spacing of your Fibonacci chains, you can have an infinity of different angles from the rotational center. Right? So if you just took phi to the power 1, you only have 10 just 10 beams that can go out. But if you say, all right, I'm going to go to phi to the power 3, you'll see that at another angle you have more beams. If you go to phi to the power 4, you have more. And if you're allowed to go to phi to the infinity, then you have an infinity of directions of Fibonacci chains that can be drawn in the infinite Penrose tiling. So in a finite uh, object, like we're going to work with a finite but very large quasi-crystal, we will have an exceedingly large number of directions that a, that a dipole can be pointed in or a particle can propagate in, uh, but it won't, it won't be infinite, but it'll be good enough. Okay, so after lunch I'll talk about why gravity in this toy idea would be only attractive and why it would drop this 1 over r squared. <laughs>